Uh, I'll try to keep you awake for a little bit. Uh, it's, uh, keep it like a woman's skirt, right? Long enough to cover everything, short enough to keep everyone's attention. I'll try, I'll try our best for that. Um, so, anatomy. Uh, man, how cool is that, right? Like, it's just the passion for horseshoe, right? So, for me, the love of horseshoe is no matter how much you know, how good you become, you can always do better and learn more. And, you know, I chased the competitive world there for a little bit. I got lucky at a couple of contests. And, uh, you know, I got to study anatomy. And it's the more you, the more you study, the less you know, right? It's a pretty incredible, incredible thing. And uh, <clears throat> when, uh, when you're studying anatomy, when you first start out, it can be one of those things where uh, a lot of people that we get to see through the school will tell me how, oh, I'm not very smart, and I can't learn anatomy, and all of those things. What I find, no matter what it is, the harder you work at something, the more you enjoy it. Be it. Like that's, whether it's my marriage, whether it's building horseshoes, listening to music, whatever it is, the harder I work at it, the more I study it, the more I enjoy it. So I challenge you, when you start looking at anatomy, don't look at it as a daunting task. You know? How do you develop it? One bite at a time, right? So break anatomy down, start studying it. And as you go through it, you'll start to learn, man, this is what makes you wake up in the morning. It, it's, what, uh, it's, it's a really cool thing. Um, I've always loved this, uh, loved this quote. Um, I remember one of my trips to England, there was a, a thank you Richard Ellis, and uh, this was one of the awesome items of this poem. And uh, those of you that don't know my dad, he's written a couple books. Um, it's pretty exciting to see that. So he wrote a bit more about the 12 most influential men in his shooting career. If you guys get a chance to read that, I encourage you. But he's, he's uh, hopefully he'll get his novel out. He'll just finish it up like one Sunday. I'll be a good book for you guys. Uh, then this is the, the one of the nail. Uh, the one of the nail, the shoe was lost. The one of the shoe, the horse was lost. The one of the horse, the rider was lost. The one of the rider, the battle was lost. For the one of the battle, the human was lost. All the one, the horse you nail. So, uh, horse shoes have always been a really important thing. My point is, yeah, being a horse shoe around technology is always a bad idea, isn't it? I gotta have people that like guide me through everything I do when it comes to computers. When we first start off, uh, I was talking to someone earlier this week how they were they were telling me about how they don't really know their terminology, and, and I think that that's such a huge important thing, right? Because you don't want to be in a situation where the vet's talking to you, and he's like, "Yes, the foot bone is attached to the, the leg bone." You don't, you don't want to be that guy, right? And so the first way that you can kind of identify that you've studied and put some effort in is at least use the correct words. Use the correct vocabulary words, right? Um, so, and I kind of going to start off a little bit on a basics. I don't know what the, what the crowd's going to be, so we're going to kind of start off and make it basics, look at the little bit of that. I got some really cool dissection videos in here. Um, you guys have the opportunity to feel a horse apart? Man, thank you. Um, I, I find that you need to take about eight apart before you really have an idea of what you're going, going on. Okay? So that's, uh, and I mean the whole horse. That's uh, one of the most incredible experiences. I feel like you're taking a drink from a fire hose that first time around, but it's a neat thing. Uh, so the words that we're going to use uh, when we're above or closer to the top line, uh, above the knee or the hawk is going to be the words cranial and cotton. Cranial? Cranial is obviously going to be towards the cranium. Cog is going to be towards the back end. Uh, you're going to hear words like anterior and posterior. Okay? Now, anterior and posterior are really inappropriate when you're talking about eyeball and horse. When you're talking about a biped, the two legged creature like we are, anterior and posterior is a pretty perfect word. But when you're talking about a quadruped, the only time there's a couple muscles around the eyeball that they really use anterior and posterior for. So AP or inferior posture isn't something that we should really ever be using unless you guys are starting to show a lot of, a lot of bike heads. Okay. Uh, I haven't had much bike today. My wife jumps every time I run on it. Now, once we get away from and, and start moving towards the ground, the words we're going to use are like dorsal and palmar. So dorsal is going to be the front edge of, in front of the leg. Okay, 
so the lane is going to be from the carpets and tarses down. And so the front of that lane is going to be a word called Dos. The back side of the front lane is going to be a word called Paul. Okay? So if you can imagine your Paul, right? So as you go through this, if you're going to do something in numbered anatomy, um, so if you raise your hand, your first finger is what? Going to be medial or lateral? Okay, you all can hear your right? When you raise your fourth finger, that's going to be medial or lateral. Anyone want to see my second finger? I get to see it a lot while I drive. Um, and you have to get rid of it, you understand that. I think I'm number one for some reason. Um, so, but if we put our hand up, right, think about the fact, doors is going to be like the top of our hand, palm is going to be like the bottom. On the hind leg, the words we're going to hear are dorsal and plantar. Anyone ever heard of plantar fasciitis, plantar ligament, or uh, a plantar wart? That's all on the bottom of your foot, right? So that would be the back side of the hind leg. Leg being, again, again, from the carpus or tarsus down towards the ground. Now I keep saying, uh, I don't quite use the right terminology yet because I haven't said it yet, right? I haven't quite yet said it. So the next words we're going to use are proximal and distal. So proximal means closer to the center of mass, and distal means further away. Okay. So whenever we're talking about the leg, that's going to be everything from the carpus and tarsus par distally. Okay. Um, medial is going to be down the median line, down the line, towards the lateral line. All of this is pretty simple. Uh, so the other two words on there, we're going to be talking about the chart. Now this gets a little bit more difficult. Is the word dorsal? The whole time we're talking about dorsal, we've been talking about the front of the leg, right? So when you're talking about the trunk of the horse, the word dorsal is going to be the top line. So I think of a dorsal fin. And the bottom line is going to be ventral. Um, Starting off, there's five main types of bones. Uh, these are what, this is what holds everything together. This is the structure. Uh, we kind of have to have a little bit of an understanding of that. Uh, there's a... I got, there's a girl that did my website, Van Rachel, she's doing some flashcards here soon, and she did all the drawings of this. So that's, I've got to go thank you guys for that. Um, our first bone we're going to talk about, are, bones themselves are very economic in the way they're made. If we think about the weight of a bone, if it was solid, when that horse is moving, let's say a horse is able to do 30 mile an hour, that means at some point, that horse's leg needs to be doing 60 mile an hour to overcome 7 and then 30 mile an hour, right? So for that to happen, that needs to be pretty lightweight. If we had a solid bone at the, at the end, all the muscles at the end, that'd be like putting your ass shoes on the bottom of our feet and expecting us to run. Because all that weight would be towards the end. So bones themselves are very economic in the way they're made. Uh, and growing in utero, growing in general, and healing themselves, the fact that they are made out of the least amount of material and get the most amount of strength, also being a pipe that allows them, well not necessarily a pipe, but if you, uh, they're hollow, and that allows for a lot of movement. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a super high speed video of a cannonball on a racehorse. That is incredible, right? And it's like, why doesn't every horse have a function after you watch that video, right? That bone has to move. And that's kind of a neat thing about bone. The oldest bone in this entire room is about five years old, right? And it's not like, not like you get that email on your phone, hey man, um, hope, you're, hope you don't mind not working next week and take a few minutes. We'll, we'll have a back in five to ten business days, right? You know, it's breaking it down on a cellular level, the level of replacing it. And then that tube, what that allows for, so if you ever take a bone and cut it in half, you're going to see that one side of that tube is usually built up to counteract the, the, the forces that are put in. Uh, so that's the economics bone, the way they're grown. The first one we're going to talk about are flat bones. Now, whenever I think of flat bone, I think of a knight, knight armor, right? So a flat bone, their main purpose is going to be to protect your vital organs. My, my rib cage is going to be way more important than my skull because this stuff in here is going to be, uh, I got, it's kind of not a lot up here. So the, the lungs and heart are going to be way more important than me. So wherever you would have a, a helmet or a breastplate, that's where a flat bone is going to be. They're going to go through what's called an intermembranous ossification. Um, so in utero, there's going to be a uh, real thin little, little membrane, and that ossifies, and that ossifies, that's what turns into your flat bones. Good example of flat bones is going to be your skull and your ribs. Um, yeah. Your regular bones. Um, if you look at uh, if you look at your regular bones, if you look at like a, a thoracic vertebrae versus a, a cotyledonal vertebrae or a cervical vertebrae, you take all of them, set them next to each other, and they don't look like each other. Okay? 
you take a cannonball and you, you take a cannonball and a humerus and femur, and they've got different shapes, but generally speaking, they're kind of a long shaft, and you can kind of put them together, right? But those, uh, there are a lot of different shapes. Now their purpose is they're going to protect the spinal column and they're going to make up the back. How neat, we got a really cool drawing here in a little bit, but how neat is the suspension bridge of the vertebrae, right? How that's set up, okay? That's a, that's a really, really neat thing. Um, so if we think about or how the horse is moving himself, we're going to see that all the, on the hind limb, if we look at the front limb, you guys have ever skinned a deer, killed a deer, butchered anything, you can take the front limb off completely. It's all hung on one muscular structure, right? But when you get to the hind limb, you guys ever try to uh, cut apart that, that coxal cord, right? That joint in the hip? Yeah, right? So you look at this end of the of a, uh, scapula, and you're going to see that it's just kind of a cup. Then you cut into the, into the pelvis, and then that acetabulum, that socket that you see is called an acetabulum, and it's a lot more capsulated. But if we think about how that works, yes, a horse can do a lot of pulling with this front end. You guys ever see a pulling horse and how they're digging on the front end? You can see that the front end does a lot of work, right? So I'm not ruling it out as it's going to work. But if we think about it, the hind end is having to get a lot of that force. So that backbone is going to have to be able to take, and that backbone is going to have to be able to take, and all that force is going to have to be able to push forward. Everything from that pelvis, cranially, is getting shoved through that backbone. So it's got to be fairly rigid, and uh, it's got to protect that spinal column that has, allows all, for all that motion to happen. Okay. Um, so that's going to be your radial bones. Long bones. Long bones are the propellers, right? So this whole thing, the way it works, is these, uh, this horse is going to be put together, and everything is going to work off of uh, levels, right? It's going to be all our mechanics for the horse. It's like the puppeteering effect, right? All our mechanics for our horse are going to be happening from proximally to the carcass and tarsus, okay? And almost, on the high level, a lot of this is still even, even higher than that. You know, a lot of the way the function is without superclapitis and the way it works, a lot of how that's happening is happening almost proximal to the tibia, right? So there's a lot of how this works, the puppeteer effect is all happening really high up. Well, for this to work, what you need to have is you need to have a leather system, and it's not like a hydraulic cylinder. So when you look at a, a, a tractor, right, you've got a hydraulic cylinder and you push just as much as you can pull. But with horses or with muscles and tendons, the way this works is the muscle has one job in mind, it can contract. Okay, so it, 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 that's its job, it contracts. When it contracts, it's going to pull against the tendon, or it might pull directly against the bone, but nonetheless, what it's going to end up pulling against is going to have to be in a mechanical advantage to allow that horse to do what we want him to do. As you're studying, for me, I have a small brain. Road memorization is useless, right? That whole A goes to B goes to C is useless. Like I, I will forever not learn that, okay? So as I'm studying, the things that I ask is why is it there, how does it work? I look at it from a mechanical perspective. That's just kind of how my brain works. And I find that the most effective way to learn. And where I'm going with this is as I'm talking about these long bones and having levers, when you're looking at it, when you have a bone and you're looking at the bone, if it has a knot, figure out why that knot is there. Okay? Once you figure out why that knot's there, then I remember that knot. But until I know why it's there, what its function is, how it's going to propel that horse forward, it's, it's just a, a weird spot and not going to draw what I'm drawing at this time. So for me, and it's really interesting, the more you learn, the easier it is to learn more. Okay? You have that, that base to grow on. So don't get discouraged and keep working on it. Okay? Um, anatomy is super interesting. Uh, so all of this is going to work. Uh, on that on that pulley system, you know, your muscles are going to contract, they're going to pull against the lever, that lever is going to push against the other side of the wall, all of those things. Uh, learn the importance of the knots. I've always loved this saying, uh, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum, I wish to place it, and I shall move the world on the knees, right? So, it's kind of, kind of neat, right? Uh, as we're looking at the lever, one of the uh, clearest levers closest to the ground that I can see is our tarsus, okay? So when we look at our tarsus, if we look right, let's see if I can do this right. If we look right there, there's kind of our point of articulation. If we look there, that's where everything inserts, okay? We've got five muscles that insert right into there. Five muscles insert, and that's called the, the, the calcaneus, and that muscle group that inserts into there is called the 
all the college in the group. On humans, we sort of call the Achilles tendon. I don't know if you guys have found anyone that has had an Achilles tendon injury. It's, uh, it's kind of an in, in, in it, right? Uh, so this lever is pretty huge. So if we look from there to there, uh, a better lever to explain a long bone would kind of be in the proximity of the femur, but none of us get to see that very often, right? We all get to see this one, so I thought this was the best example. If we look to the left side of our screen, what we'll see, if we have an equal lever on both sides of the fulcrum, it's going to have to take the same amount of force to lift something on both sides, right? For every foot that we gain on the other side of how long we're on the fulcrum, we gain that amount of force. So in this drawing, we're figuring that there's going to take 100 pounds of force on this side. So on this drawing, I'm going to be in equilibrium. 100 pounds of force is going to be, I'm going to just be balanced out. On a two-foot lever, I'm going to be able to create 200 pounds of force with 100 pounds down here. And with a three-foot lever, le le lever, I'm going to be able to get 300 pounds of force on this side. So it becomes fairly impressive for every, every foot you gain, more or less, you end up gaining the amount of force you put in here. You know, we're talking about 100 pounds, but if you look at water stuff, when you guys have to build a horse to pull, pull a horse apart and pull your glutes off, your glute muscles, they weigh like 40 pounds. I don't know what kind of force that creates, but it's way more than 100 pounds, right? Then you look at that common county field tendon group, and there's five muscles that certain of that with a five-inch lever, man, you're going to gain a tremendous amount of mechanical so again, look for why those levers are there. Anytime you see a point of articulation and a knot a long way away from it, something cool inside is happening there. Look for it. Find out why it's there. Let's see here. I gotta point that way. Now the next one are gonna be our, our sesamoids that we talked about. The best example of sesamoids are gonna be uh, uh, what are those on this list? Sesamoids, yes, sesamoids. Uh, the other one is gonna be our distal sesamoid or our navicular bone. And what these do is they change the direction of pull. How many of you guys have been leading a two-year-old and then all of a sudden the two-year-old's leading you? Has anyone ever had that happen? All right, maybe you guys have been up horses. Come and come link with me. We'll get the opportunity. Um, so as that's happening, how do you get that two-year-old to stop leading you, right? You're skiing behind Fluffy. All you have to do is just take a step. I'll take a step before that way. Take a step this way. Change the direction of pull by 10 degrees. And now you can pull that thousand pound animal around, right? So all I've got to do to get a mechanical advantage is change my direction to pull by 10 degrees. And now I am able to stop a thousand pound animal that was dragging me and I was going on a ski trip, right? Well, skiing on the river, the lake's a lot more fun than skiing in the mud, I promise you. Okay? You guys should be more interested, don't you think? Uh, so if we look here, this, how cool is that photo? Is that not, not a cool photo? So if we look here, there's an avicular bone, a deep flexor tendon passes through, our important ligament there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like dissections are awesome, right? I think that's a really cool photo. But you can see, had that not been there, you can see how that would pass directly through there. I guess that's the point of both, both screens up. So, had that ligament road not been there, focus your tongue and out is important because they're trying to use the other Alright, so how that navicular would not been there, instead of coming out and around it, it's just going to come straight through. So that's what your sesamoids are going to do for you. They're going to change the direction of the pool, and again, I think about it as a two-year-old who's leading me, how I actually saw it from the beginning. And it's I can become a trauma. Now the next one we're going to talk about is short bones. Short bones are really, really great for concussion reduction. Now, are they softer? No. But what they do is they're designed in a way that it causes the, the, the forces to go in the opposite directions. So when you guys look at this part of this, can you see how there's a ridge? Okay, we're going to look at this bottom row of carpal bones. Can you see how this ridge comes up and pushes right between our intermediate carpal and our radial carpal? Again, going back to the number of anatomy, this is going to be a left front in these drawings. When you have your uh, anatomy, put your hand in front of me. You guys all know what the old one says? It's that spot that we hit when we're square while we're riding. So that's the elbow of the horse. Follow that down, does that sit on the lateral side or the medial side? So if that's on the lateral side, do you think the old on the or the radial purple is going to be on the lateral side? Right? So all the purple is going to be on the lateral side. The one in between the intermediate purple, the radial purple will be on that medial side. The one on the back, the women love, it's like candy, the accessory purple, when they're accessorizing. Um, that's the one on the back there. So if we look here, this is C3, there's our, uh, there's our radial carpal there. Can you see how C3 is coming up and it's creating this, uh, it's 
creating this ridge, and that's pushing up right into this intercarpal ligament. Can you guys the intercarpal uh, joint? So we'll do that over here. You guys see that? See how it's pushing up? So when Fluffy bears weight, what's going to happen? Fluffy's going to bear weight, C3 is going to push up, it's going to cause that radial carpal to push out. Right? It's going to cause those joints to go apart. Well, guess what's happening just to the, to the bottom side of the line? Look where the radial carpal is going. It's lining up right in between C3 and C4. Right? And so now, as it presses down, it's causing our forces to go out. And guess what's happening from the, 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 the distal side of the line? Our cannabis is coming up, and it's going right through that intercarpal ligament, which is causing those forces to go out. Isn't that neat? Okay, maybe I'm a nerd, I don't know. Uh, also, right now when we're at rest, look at our intercarpal ligament. Okay? Look at this ligament and how it sets. This may be one of my favorite set of slides in this next slide. Whenever you have a horse and you first take a step, right? When you walk the horse move, he has to have extension twice in his stride. When he's walking, he has to come in, fully extend, he loads, and then he has to extend and press himself off again, right? So you have two points of extension. But when a horse is running, he's going to go out and he's going to fling his legs out in front of him, right? And at that point, our carpals, when we look at our carpals, the dorsal third or carpal bones are going to be the dorsal third or two thirds, they're going to be like stacked rock on top of each other, okay? So if we didn't have a way of dealing with this, when the bone would flung his leg out, they would be doing a belly flop. We've all seen that belly flop happen, right? So if we didn't have a way of dissipating that energy, if it arrested it, arrest it, that would be like just throwing those rocks and dropping them directly on each other. It's a tremendous amount of force, so it would be a problem, right? If your articulation is going to happen, you follow the third and two thirds of your carpet, depending on which one you're talking about. But the dorsal third of our carpus, the front third, is going to be where that's going to happen. It's going to be like stacked, stacked rock, okay? When we look, what we're going to notice is how our radial carpal, when I go to this next slide, this is how our articulation looks like as that horse moves. And look at that intercarpal ligament. Look between the radial carpal and the intermediate carpal, and each one of those dogs. You guys see that? Is that showing up? Can you see that intercarpal ligament, how it changes and has an angle to it? Is that clear enough for that? Okay. So as it forms bears weight, the way that the, the, the condyles and this one and the radius are, as it bears weight, it's going to cause your radial purple and your intermediate purple to kind of come past each other. Okay? So as the fluffy flings this leg out there, you guys can see that intercarpal ligament has a tremendous amount of angle in it and flexion. You guys see that? And as it bears weight, it actually goes in another direction. So what's going to happen when he flings that out there, that radial purple is going to hit. Okay? Over here. You guys can see right now, you guys see how that radial carpal is way far distant, right? Now, as it starts to extend, look at what this intermediate carpal does. Right? As that joint starts to extend, can you see that intermediate carpal? We're starting to line up with that ridge that we had. Let's see here. You guys see in this ridge here? Look what's happening. Is that going? You guys see how it's starting to line up with that ridge, right? So now, when he extends, it's going to slide down that, that intercarpal ligament. So when he flings that out there, the first point of contact is going to be our radial carpal. Now it's going to start arresting that extension because that ligament, that intercarpal ligament between our radial carpal and our intermediate carpal, is going to start taking that. And it's going to not cause a belly flop, but it's going to allow that joint to extend and arrest that extension. Is that cool? That is so cool, right? So, you can see that there? Look at this photo here. You can start really seeing how clear that is, right? You see how it's starting to slide down right there? And then boom. Look at how that other part of the went from going in this direction to this direction. What's also interesting is if you look at this joint, your collateral ratings on this joint more or less stay the same length as it goes through flexion. When we look at the whole picture, uh, when you first look at the skeleton of the horse and, and you see it, I always kind of think that the backbone is like a, a suspension bridge. So the vertebrae, because it's kind of like the sentinel, if we change the direction of the pool, we can gain a great mechanical advantage. 
So let's find the suspension bridge, right? The suspension bridge has these way high pillars that has this cable that comes down and it holds down the rudder, right? So the backbone, if you look at the thoracic vertebrae, so when we go through and we see these photos here in a minute, and you guys are going to see a spike through blood, okay? There's going to be, there's going to be a spike that looks like I'm about to take into the ceiling and try to wait for a lightning storm to see if I can revive it, right? And that spikes out the Right inside the cell. But what you're going to notice is those spikes are way far down. Like they're way down there. I just barely missed my vertebrae when I put those in. Okay? So if we look, those thoracic vertebrae, they're quite long. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten to look at it. But because of that, that makes those pillars. Right? So our supraspinous ligament, when it gets uh, more cranially, it's called the nuchal ligament, but our supraspinous ligament acts like the cable. Right? And then our backbone is ventilated to that, and you can see that would be the road. Where the, the bottom of the bones are, that's going to be the road that you would drive on, and that's what holds everything up. Isn't that, isn't that neat? Well, like us humans, we designed something pretty cool, right? We just looked at the anatomy and went off of it. I don't know what it was. Then the next thing is, I always, the, the, because that's higher, that allows him to pick up his head. I always see the Martin Gravel when I look at that, or, or not Martin Gravel, but Fred Flintstone. On a dinosaur up picking rocks. So that's how that's how changing the direction of pull gives you a huge mechanical advantage. Okay? Alright, so you see that spike? That's what I was talking about. Look at that spike. Look how far ventilated it is. That's huge, isn't it? Uh, so we're getting back to the leather, right? I don't know. I should watch out for it. What time is it, guys? So what are you missing? Make sure I try to time it right. Going over, and you guys aren't staring at me for the last 15 minutes. Uh, so, when you watch a horse move, right, what's happening in the scapula? What is the scapula doing as that horse is moving? What you're going to notice is Fluffy is moving his leg forward, right? As Fluffy is moving his leg forward, that scapula is actually coming back. Okay? So, his scapula is going to be coming back, and at the same time, when the Fluffy is pushing himself off, the proximal end of that scapula is going forward, it's going cranial. Okay? So what do we have? We have a massive lever. Uh, do you guys see that red circle? That red circle right there? That red circle is tying uh, uh, a point around articulation and the front limb is going to move around. Okay? So if we look at what inserts there, we're going to have a regular spallicus muscle. So that's going to be this green line here. Okay? So when this green line pulls, this green line is pulling. When this blue line is pulling, these blue lines are pulling. That's what that looks like. Okay? So you can see this muscle comes down and it inserts right on that uh, the, on the medial side there. This muscle right here is called the brachiocephalicus muscle. This green line right here, the green muscle on the on the cranial aspect, that's the brachiocephalicus muscle. And so as that pulls up, guess where it's inserted? Certain right in, kind of like that uh, uh, yellow and tuberosity right down that outer side. Well, on, the, on, the, on the medial side, you have the terrace major tubercle, which is, is, is almost in, exactly on the opposite side of the yellow and tuberosity. Okay? Um, and that is where this muscle is coming down in certain It's called the reticulum torso. Okay? That's the blue line. So, can you imagine right now, as this horse is extending himself forward, can you see how that muscle is pulling up? This muscle is pulling back. That gives us 20, uh, 18 to 24 inch level. You guys see that? Okay. Now, when we look at the, the joints, are usually named after bones directly above, directly below. Uh, below. So, this joint right here, scapula, I think we're scapula, the wrong scapula, the wrong joint. You can say it fast and always get you there. So this joint is called the scapula and moral joint, okay? And what's interesting, how many of you guys heard of a rotator cuff, right? So it's like this magical piece of anatomy that they can go in and cut out. Well, not really. The rotator cuff is a group of five muscles coming in and hold that joint together. So it's really interesting, if you take that scapula and moral joint apart, when you're done, you don't actually have any collateral ligaments. You take all the muscles away and leave the capsule ligament, you can pull that joint apart four or five inches. It's crazy. But what we've got is those five muscles come around, and what they do is they really strengthen this joint so that whenever we pull on this lever, it allows it to work like a lever. So those muscles are, are, are really getting rigidity to that joint so that we have that 20.4 inch lever. 
super heat, super heat. Now, do you guys see the size of this muscle versus this muscle? Pretty well, yeah. That one's pretty well. Underlying and well, you're saying work, right? This is even more of a friend. So, right here, that's pretty well when you compare this muscle and this muscle, right? Why is that? So, the idea, when you're having a horse move, I challenge you to not look for extensor, extensor and flexor muscles. I challenge you to not look at your muscles in that way. I challenge you to look at what muscles are going to cause cranial motion of the limb and port propulsion. So, when we're looking, we kind of think about muscles, the uh, extensor muscles and flexor muscles, right? That's kind of how we think about things. But I challenge you to look at muscles as what's for port propulsion and cranial motion of the limb. And the reason that I challenge you to do that is you see these muscles right here, the blue muscles on the cranial aspect, the blue lines on the cranial aspect. You guys see that? Well, those are for forward propulsion. What? On the cranial aspect is for forward propulsion? Isn't anything for forward propulsion supposed to be on the back side, the palm? Right? And that's not how it works. So I challenge you to look at your muscles for what's the forward propulsion and cranial and cranial motion you lend. So this muscle, when it pulls, is going to pull back. This muscle is going to pull forward, and doing that, that flow is going to cause that value to go forward, right? Okay. Well, what we've got, look at these big bad dudes right here. Those are impressive size muscles, right? So as Fluffy's underweight there, right, right, and he's trying to pull himself forward, our resistance towards this muscle right here is going to pull back. It's going to pull back right there in that medial aspect, just on the inside of our deltoid tuberosity, okay? There's a, there's a little tubercle on the inside, there's a big tubercle. So this is going to pull back. As that pulls back, these are going to pull forward. So that is how we're going to get forward propulsion. Even though those muscles are on the cranial aspect, they're going to be hugely important for forward propulsion, aren't they? Also, if you look, look at where our bones are going to sit. Our bone is going to come down here, and then it's going to come back. Okay? If we look, our muscle, our latissimus dorsi, is kind of inserted in the center of the frame. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But just kind of think about what's going to happen. As I pull back on an apron, what's going to happen? Okay? Uh, anyway. So the next muscle we're going to talk about is going to be our, our uh, uh, subscribers muscle. And that's this muscle right here. Again, great to the great for a forward propulsion. It's going to come in, it's going to insert on the cranial aspect. It's going to insert on the cranial aspect. This way. Cranial aspect of our scalpel. Okay? And it's going to come down and it's going to start our sternum. As it contracts, what it's going to do is it's going to pass right over that scapular and roll joint. So as it passes over that scapular and roll joint and it contracts, it's going to pull that scapula, it's going to pull that cranial aspect of the end approximately of our scapula forward. At the same time, it's going to push that scapular and roll joint back, and that's going to be huge for our core propulsion. Okay? It's a really important muscle. And uh, without this little, little thing, it's going to want to flip around the medial side. So on the high end, we're talking about the puppeteer effect a little bit earlier. Everything we do is going to be like a puppeteer, right? All of our muscles are way up here to affect our bones way far down, okay? So think about, and especially when we start talking about reciprocal apparatus. So reciprocal apparatus is when one joint flexes and another joint has to flex. That's the definition of reciprocal apparatus. So what it allows, especially in the pelvic limb, if I can cause our stifle joint, our lower tibial joint to flex or extend, if I can cause it to do that thing, then I can cause my hog, my conscious paralysis joint to flex and extend as well. Okay? So because of the resistance quadratus and how it works, we have very much a puppeteer effect. Uh, uh, so we have a very low acceleration. So as we have this apron, right, we have this, this thing, and it's just like we have on the front end, if we have muscles in a certain middle of that apron, right, and as this thing pulls back, once it becomes a little bit straighter, it's going to want to extend. It's going to want to extend. It's going to extend. But it's going to, it's going to extend at a multi-negative rate. It's going to extend. It's going to extend at one, and then it's going to extend twice that, and then twice that, and twice that. Because we're in the center of that apron when it's pulling, again, remember what we're thinking about motion. Horse has to have full extension, he's on the load, he's going to pull back, and then he has to have that full extension again. Because the muscles are inserted in the center of that apron, that's where we're going to get that second extension. You guys seeing how that might work? It's kind 
follow me on that? And again, because that atrium, as it extends, it's going to extend faster and faster and faster. It's going to have that very, very low acceleration, okay? So when we look here, uh, aren't there still balloons? Yeah. That's been a long time, right? Like, talk about somebody that was looked in the windows by something and got all that faster and faster and all that thing. It took us a few hours to get up in the room, too. But, um, so right here, this muscle here is going to be called our biceps femoris, right? Kind of coming down, and it's inserted into our patella. Our patella is incredibly important. So how many of you guys know that forces are people that have had knee problems, right? How many people have had ankle problems? Way more people that have had knee surgery, right? And if you think about the complications of this joint, how it works, it makes sense. But there is a tremendous amount of muscle that inserts directly into our patella. So I think that this, this little area needs way more attention paid to it. So if we think about our angles of our leg, here and here, this muscle right here is coming around and it's right in the center of that apron, right? And on the medial side, we've got our system and most of your muscles are coming around and it's right in the center of that. And uh, yeah, you can see how these muscles are coming around, the are muscles are coming around and certainly more or less right in here. Now, uh, this bicep femoris, it's an interesting muscle in the way that it originates. So usually when we see a muscle, or we think about origin insertion, right? We like to think of the, like, the superficial flexion of tendon, right? It has this insertion. It's got the, the subcondylar fossil of the tendon, right? You pull it apart, there's an insertion, there's an origin. It's like so pretty, it has a point. But what we find out, once you get into the higher limb, a lot of these origins are more like a car. So if you guys have ever drawn a big car or a tent or anything down and you try to drag it, have you guys, uh, it, it's hard to drag it, right? And you know what I'm talking about? But because we have that, we can have that same kind of organ. So our biceps and morris muscles, this muscle right here, and it kind of comes around and lays over the top of our movie muscles. And it's going to come down and it's going to circle back to the center of the anchor. It also is going to come down and become part of this, uh, this uh, uh, common palatine you know, here. But these two muscles kind of pose each other, maybe a lateral, come and start to center that area, and they're going to pull that back. So they're going to be really great for our form of propulsion. All of those muscles, which are going to be the same as the all of these muscles are, are, are gluteal muscles. So what's neat is our gluteal muscles, you can't really set them away, separate them away very easily um, from like the magician's forces. Um, kind of all becomes one. So you end up with this tension band all the way from the cranial aspect, all the way around to here. You almost think about when you watch a horse run, right? He comes in, he builds his energy, and then he explodes out. The muscles are all kind of contracting and shoving himself off at the same time. All right. So again, going back to the movement of the patella. So right here, oh, 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 oh. right here we have our quadriceps. Okay. I don't like all the ligaments and ligaments. Yes, that's what they're going to be called. But if we think about the function of what that is. All of our quadriceps, we have a ton of muscle, biceps and morris, all of these muscles are coming around and insert directly in their patella. So when they insert into that patella, when they contract, they're going to pull the patella. When you pull on the patella, the patella ligaments are going to come down, they're going to insert approximately the tibia. So what's going to happen? They are going to be responsible for extending that, that femoral, uh, femoral tibial joint, right? So it's not, a, I don't like thinking of them as ligaments because I think they're more of a tendon. Okay? And then the patella itself is like a big up fiber carpet. But we'll talk about that here if I don't run out of time. So if we watch what that patella does, you guys can see these are our patella ligaments here. Uh, you can see how that's setting. There's that really pretty origin of our superficial flexor muscle right there. But we can see how the patella moves around. Also, you guys see this little spot right here? I'm not gonna walk over there. That little spot right there, man. That right there is called the meniscus. But what's really neat about this joint is watching how it articulates. So you can see where that, that joint sits. It's kind of very granularly as it comes back to the point of articulation. It starts moving hollowly quite a bit, doesn't it? So what happens when a horse has a walking patella? And, and the problem with stifle injury is when we hear a horse has a stifle injury, the thing we think about is stifle. But there's so much more going on in that joint. You have, you have two menisci, you've got cruciate ligaments, all of these happening. The, the patella ligaments, their injury in the locking patella very rarely is a problem dealing with the stifle force, the stifle 
horse to have a stifle injury. A stifle horse is one that is locked in the stifle. Then we deal with that. But when we have a horse that's laying in the stifle, this joint is way more complicated than a, a, a stifle horse. When a horse stifles, I needed to be a better photo, but there's a, there's a little knot right here, and, and our, our patella locks us over the top of that patella, uh, over that knot, that medial patella that we box over it. So because of that, it doesn't allow that to happen. It doesn't allow it to flex. So that is what's happening in the cycle. But how can I get that to unlock? So if we go back one photo, if we need to admit it's coming around to the medial side, that patella is coming around the medial side, locking over and off right there. That's kind of the photo you guys see on the left hand side. What would I do mechanically to unlock that? I would just grab that and move it to the lateral side. Wait a minute. I'm just kind of grab it for over. Well, what would I be able to do to use to do that? Well, hey, it's built in. You guys see that muscle insert right in the, the lateral side of that patella? So if we build that muscle up, it's going to be able to pull that around and function like it's supposed to. Okay? Uh, there we go. Uh, that's, uh, that's kind of what we were just talking about. So right here, this is our tension pashavana. Uh, I've cut it and I'm going to fold it back right here. But look right here, there's our patella. Look how that bicep femoris right here. See that bicep femoris is coming in and starts right into that patella. So because of our, our, our knowledge of anatomy, now we can think, well, what are we going to do for shooting to help that horse? Really, we need to teach you to work, work up the mountain and build up that bicep more. It's going to be the best thing to do for a lot of people to tell But if you look at this joint, there is so much more going on in that joint than the lot of people So when a horse has a stifle injury, I would caution you to think of stifle. I'd be looking more at a stifle injury when and inside of that, you're going to have bursus, you're going to guy, all of those things. And the very last photo in my, in my deal had a picture of that joint, and it's, a, it's kind of a neat photo. Um, uh, locking mechanisms and counter work that. Alright, the reciprocal apparatus. So, the reciprocal apparatus, the definition of reciprocal apparatus is when our, our moral tibial joint flexes, our partial corral joint has to flex. When our moral tibial joint extends, our partial corral joint has to extend. Okay? So, this is a really cool mechanical drawing here. This is our tibia. Anytime that you guys are studying and you have a, a, a structure that bypasses a bone, something cool is happening. So we've got two structures that completely bypasses the tibia. This first one we can see on that, on that kind of the bowel aspect, <coughs> it looks more, more towards the proximal end. But there, there right there is our superficial flexor uh, tendon and muscle. On the cranial aspect, we're going to have something called the proteus surges. And the pelvic surgeon has a muscle laying right underneath it. It's called the tibialis cranialis. That's one you don't hear about very often. But I think it's a really important muscle. So if we look at this, think about our green line. If I were to pull up, go with the green line, if I were to extend this out, what's going to happen to the our superficial pressure today? It's going to have no choice but to pull. Because it's going to have a lot of uh, tendinous tissue through it. And, and how many of you guys wanted to think superficial flexor muscle was going to be way more impressive than that? Is that not a bony muscle? Right? Like it's pretty disappointing. Okay, this is well. Uh, interesting. Um, but we can see as I move this this direction, it's going to have no choice but to pull on the calcaneus. By pulling on the calcaneus, it's going to have no choice but to extend that. Look at our, look at our point of articulation. See? There's our lever we were talking about in the beginning. You guys see that? There's one that we're talking about there. Okay. Now the cranial aspect, that's going to be our permanent structures. Right there, originating this one of the femur coming down, of course, is this side, and so it's going to be our, our third metatarsal tarsal and our fourth tarsal. Um, coming down the medial side. Model that's called the canine tendon. Um, I should have added one photo to that. So can you guys understand how that works, right? So when I flex this joint, this joint has no choice but to flex. When I extend this joint, it has no choice to extend because of these two cables that we, we have going on. You guys understand all of that? So that's how that cervical apparatus works. So the passive stay apparatus, whatever allow 
allows his horse to stand with a minimal amount of muscular effort. Whenever it allows his horse to stand with a minimal amount of muscular effort. How is it, when we start talking about it, that we, we use muscles like our biceps, biceps brachii? Why is it that our biceps brachii? I get you know you're really nice when I'm hanging up in his office. I need to mend it for you. His apprentice tended to play along and took it out that night. Two weeks later, we found it in the But it never made sense to me. How is it that allow, the definition of passive state apparatus is whatever allows the horse to stand a minimal amount of muscle effort? How is it then that we have these muscles that become part of the passive state apparatus? Our uh, stratus and callus. How is it that our stratus and callus is a huge part of our, our passive state apparatus? It's a muscle. How is it that our bicep brachii is part of our passive state apparatus? It's a muscle. How is that possible? But what we're going to find out is a lot of these muscles, like our superficial pleasure tendon, our, our chromium search, tibialis, cranialis, that combo. What you have is you have a cable that runs all the way through these structures. That cable runs all the way through these structures and then the muscles contract. So in, in a relaxed state, when you're weight bearing, the tendon, fascia tissue, is holding the weight. The muscles are relaxed, but once they contract, can you see how that tendon is able to get, become non weight bearing? And it's going to become slack. You guys can understand this concept? So if we go to this next photo, we can see this muscle. And when you cut through this muscle, it doesn't have very much muscle tissue. But what you have is you have fascia bands that go all the way through it. You have tendinous tissue that passes all the way through this muscle. So that is what allows you have your your cyclical apparatus, your passive state apparatus. That's what allows them to work. Okay? That is the most important part of those two structures, is the fact that there is a, a tendon that passes more or less all the way through, or tendinous type of tissue that passes all the way through. Okay? And you can see that right there, and you can see this muscle right here. You see how it's all wrinkled right up? That's the that's tibialis cranialis. Okay? The next muscle we're going to talk about is that bicep back bend. So it comes in and originates the uh, uh, superglutide uh, cubicle come down and inserts into our, our radius, completely bypasses our humerus, right? Again, anytime you have that happening, there's something cool happening. Anytime you're talking about the passive state apparatus, anything time that you have a bend, anytime that you have a bend, you have something that's really important happening, okay? You need to have something that's holding that bend in place. In this particular bend, this is what you the roll joint, the, uh, uh, this is kept in real joint. The thing that's helping us is our bicep brachii. If you look at this cross section of the bicep brachii, and you guys see these little spots of white all the way through that bicep brachii. You guys seeing those? So if we look there, and I don't know if the photo is showing up very good being, being in projection, but that right there is a tendon that passes all the way through that bicep brachii. All the way. So the tendon that passes through that tendinous tissue, that fascia tissue that passes through that is what's important for the passive state apparatus. It's not the bicep brachii muscle itself. It's the tendon that is set inside of that. Isn't that a pretty, pretty clever, neat design there? So, anyway, easily entertaining. And uh, Fluffy really wanted to learn to fly. He wanted to fly with the best of them. So, uh, if we look over here, our stratus and callus, as you do these dissections, the older the horse gets, you're going to find that the, the color and the color and the density of that fascia tissue on the stratus and callus gets deeper, darker, and thicker. Okay. So like if you ever get a chance to dissect a whole, it's just you just have striations of it. As you dissect a whole horse, these striations are quite thick, almost into this type of tissue. Okay. But if we pull this apart, right here, you guys see this, this stuff here? It's coming down, originating, or originating at the proximal of our scapula. So if you think about what we've got, we've got a horse sitting in there, and he's got these two sticks sticking up. These are his, his limbs, right? And on the top side, we have a, a rope that's attached there. It's coming down and sort of the center of the front of the stomach. Okay? Well, when that horse is into that, that rope is going to pull the proximal of that scapula in, right? 
And that's going to create that sin. It's called a thoracic sin. That's what's going to hold that up. But again, how is it that a muscle is able to carry the weight? How is that part of the passive stay effort? How does that create the sink? It isn't the muscle as much as the fascia tissue that passes through. So can you guys see those real dark striation lines passing through that? How it's originating and it's sitting right up to the proximal end of our scapula? Coming down here. And what's neat, when you look at it from the lateral side, you guys can see, it looks like a woman's, like a Chinese women's fan, how it's all fanned out. So no matter if that horse is going down a mountain, up a mountain, or any of the above, he has striations that are in line. Okay? He has striations that are in line. Okay. Now, this is really, really neat. You're not going to get this on every dissection. You guys see on that left hand side? How many of you guys remember the old written test? There is no muscle distal to the carpus of tarsus. Do you guys remember that? Yeah? About one in ten dissections, I'm going to find this muscle. Okay? So the interosseous muscle, interosseous tendon, or the suspensory ligament, you're going to see right there on the left hand side that suspensory ligament. That is a muscle head. And I've got another picture if any of you guys want to see this. Uh, I've got one behind them that I did about, I don't know, a month ago, where there's an actual tendon and a really beautiful muscle. But I've got another photo of this horse. This is the horse that my wife saved, and then we ended up doing this good. Um, but there's a tendon that comes down to the, the scalp. That, well, he didn't stand up to the first two weeks, right? And then my wife's laughing at me right now. I'm this photo. He didn't stand up to the first two weeks, so we keep been like every two hours. But because of that, he ended up like a cricketer in the Soviet signal. And I guess he was, as a four-year-old, he could probably walk. So we ended up, you know, using him. Uh, and the end here, he had this. And look at how pretty that origin is. You guys see that? See how that interosseous muscle has like a, a couple of heads coming off of it? Suspensory ligament has a couple of heads. Isn't that just a, such a, a pretty origin? Uh, anyway. Uh, then, this comes down and it inserts the arcesis point. Uh, once it inserts the arcesis point, it goes down and forth. Again, any time that we have a bend, any time that we have a bend, we need to have a way of holding that bend up. So our suspensory apparatus can be really important for a passive stay apparatus. Everything that comes in and holds our vent lock is going to be part of that suspensory apparatus, right? Uh, so what does this? It comes down and kind of creates that sling in which that holds down, right? Anytime we have a brake force pulling up, we need to think about the brake force pulling down, right? That's a really, really important thing. You can't just pull up on the sensor the whole time and not expect them to end up in front of these ears because we don't have an opposing force to pull them down, okay? Um, so this is just really good. Now this is the front leg, it's going to make the Palmer, or Palmer approximate hand, of course, is this at. It's going to search our sensor when we come down and forward, right? Of course, it's this at this way, you can say that. Um, but what we're looking at, there's going to be a tension band that comes all the way to rest this morning and, and create this tension band that holds this step lock up. So that's going to be a big part of our suspension apparatus. Well, anything that originates possible with that lock that inserts this with the step lock is probably going to become an important for that suspension apparatus. I don't have a good photo of it on here, but your subcarpal check is going to be really important for that, right? So the carpal check is going to go to our knee flexor tendon and it originates the carpus. And it is just as our knee flexor tendon and then it's going to insert the semi-nitic press for carpal. That's going to create a tension band in itself, right? How about our radial check limiters? Our radial check limiters can do the same thing. It originates proximal with our our process one and it creates a, 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 a tension band that comes all the way around to be two. So that's how that's all going to hold our suspensory apparatus up. So again, I got to go over the great opposing forces. I couldn't come up with a great photo, but I, I thought about an anchor, right? So an anchor, you've got a boat that's getting thrown around in the ocean. And it throws it down in there, and that anchor's there. At that point, that anchor is the opposing forces holding that boat in position. Okay? When we look at our sesamoids, our sesamoids all are trying to get pulled up the fluffy's ears, right? They're trying to get pulled up the fluffy's ears. What's holding them in place? Right? Another time, we have the common calibre tendon group, right? The common calibre tendon group is five tendons that come down and serve right into our, our, our calcaneus, right? 
So what is the calcaneus? The calcaneus from running on that horse's leg. We have to have a greater because this horse will down. Okay? So if we look here, is that not, is that not just pretty? Right there, look at that. Any of you guys ever seen a cruciate system in England? Or the short system in England? So this was actually done on a pole down in Iowa. You recognize that one, I mean? So, uh, I don't think this one's ever took a step, actually. Uh, but what we've got is the set point we're getting pulled up the whole time, but we're going to have some structure that's smoothing it that's going to help pull it down. So we've got a cruciate, that's not very big one, and a short, and we're kind of keeping them wanting to go uh, medial lateral. And right here, you're not going to see this in any textbooks. You're going to see this is our oblique. I didn't have a great straight system in there. I don't know. It's one of those things. I don't know. You guys ever take pictures? Right? So the straight is one of them, super cool, but I didn't have any photos of it because I guess it wasn't cool enough to take a photo of it. So I but this right here, I actually got an angry boy. This is this one. This is a clinic I did in Iowa. Uh, uh, this is a clinic I did in Iowa. And if you look, this is the oblique sismonium again. But do you see that right there? That's a, that's a chicken foot. There was a third part of that oblique be a more than that you only, I've only seen like one text with one color in Atlas. Okay? So the oblique says more than that actually has kind of three parts to it. But you can see I made a circle that this one across from seven points. And that's going to say that this one across from seven points is going to make it pull up. So these are what's going to be important for keeping these from going from the years. These are the opposing forces are holding down. These are hugely, hugely important. But yeah. I've only, I've only like, found that one time that kind of short system where you're doing it. So, I don't know. I really like that photo. Regardless, I had anything to talk about. I'm going to be able to go into this, this lecture. I'm just going to show it off. So, the, the great opposing forces, right? What is the biggest foot bone in the horse? The fourth line of parcel is the biggest, fattest foot bone in the horse. 60% of the weight's on the front end, right? Why is it that the loudest foot bone on the hind leg is the biggest, fattest foot bone? Now, next time you guys get a chance to touch tarsus, I want you to look at it. And I want you to see, when you think about carpals or uh, uh, slip bones, you kind of think, well, they're creating a surface for your carpals and tarsus to sit on, right? But next time, I want you to grab the tarsus. I want you to look at a good drawing or a good picture. And you're going to see that there is a massive hole. There is a massive gap right here. If you were laying a ruler from the fourth line of tarsus to your calcaneus, there it doesn't touch. Like probably about three quarters of an inch. There is a massive gate in the hole there. So again, going back to it, why is the fourth line of the biggest fast slip bone in the horse? But it isn't even the weight bearing if it's not if the tarsus doesn't sit on it, right? So we have that common common canal tendon group, right? So you guys can see this, the common common canal tendon group. Can you guys see the twist in it? You guys, I don't know if you can see that in the, the picture very well. But there's a really pretty twist. And that comes from the superficial flexor tendon and originating this is the other finger, and your solus, your uh, gastrocnemius, and your other muscles are going to originate proximal. So what you have is superficial flexor tendon, it originates distally, this set here, but it comes around and has a connective attachment on our calcaneus, right? So it has to come from deep, come all the way to the superficial, and insert that calcaneus process with that red calcaneus. Vernacular attachment. So with that, that's why you know that twist. Anytime you have a twist in anatomy, it's going to be a lot of strength. That's why ropes have twists, right? So I don't know if you guys can see that photo. But those five muscles come down and sit right in this point. So we have what's called the plantar ligament, right? That plantar ligament is going to originate our titanium come down and sit our fourth bone tarsal, right? Fourth tarsal, fourth bone tarsal. So what is the point of fourth bone tarsal? Is it for weight bearing? Why is this made that's from the lower horse? No. The reason that the fourth bone parcel is there is it's an anchor to keep that calcaneus from going from his ears. Just like our Sismonia thing is. Okay? Kind of neat, huh? Alright, I think this is the last uh, uh, last slide. So there's a, a concept through a lot of this anatomy is protecting the uh, protecting the rope to go over fully. So if I were to take a rope, Throw it up over the top of this air conditioner and tie it out and start picking it up. What's going to happen to my rope? My rope's going to wear out pretty quick, is it? It's going to wear against our, our, our beam or our bend or whatever I'm going to the top. So how can I protect that rope? Well, I can lubricate it, but it's no beam on it. 
Okay? Now that we're now that we're here to protect each other. But it's still a sickness of abuse. Especially if we end up having a lot of force going into it. So the first kind of thing I can do is I can throw a piece of sunlight over that thing before I did that. What does that look like in an atom? What that looks like in an atom is our magnetic kind of absorber. Okay? So if you guys look at this photo right here, pop up photo. Yes. Our top left photo, you guys can see right here on our tendon, there's this, the manufacturer comes and wraps around our new flexor tendon. That is going to set right in that skew, right? The skew is what creates that. This right here, we, we get to thinking that this is our intercessible healing, right? This hyperbolic parabola, the, the, that pinnacle shape that we have right there, we get to thinking that that itself is the interstitial pointing movement. The interstitial pointing movement sets under that. That's actually the student that creates that. It's the student that creates that. Uh, you can see it better now. So, but what we've got is that superficial flexor tendon creates that dynamic of sort of, it wraps around the deep flexor tendon, and it sets right between that student and the deep flexor tendon. So now, it's acting like that piece of leather. Every time it's up in steps, it's protecting our deep pressure from you. It's like that, that piece of leather, okay? The problem is when we do it isolated, we don't think about that, right? It's kind of like a horse is fleeing. They didn't think the horse is fleeing down very much for a long time. That thought it was like this big. Because whenever they see it, it was something big. Because the horse was dead, okay? But come to find out, the horse is fleeing holds like 19 meters to 42 meters as the horse holds. It's this massive reservoir of oxygenated blood. Right? So the problem is when we're, and this is also something to think about whenever you're dealing with a functional wound or a cut on the on the palmar aspect, plantar aspect of the leg, what position was plugged in when that cut happened? Okay? But under weight bearing, we always think that this sits proximal to the sesamoids, right? Because that's the way it looks in a dissection, because it's not weight bearing. But then as soon as it becomes weight bearing, that pulls down and it's gonna set around that, around that student. Okay? Without an arm. Uh, excuse me. Uh, okay? So it's going to protect that deep flexor tendon. Now, what else do I do? I can beef up my rope. I can beef up my rope with this tool that's going to end up over the top of our beam, right? I can make it out of a different type of rope, a little bit stronger type of rope. So what that will look like, so this right here is the, the uh, moral head, and right here is the fiber cartilage. So you've got three little knots in the proximal end of the humerus. Two of them are prevented to insert into. The third one is a ridge for your, your bicep brachii to pass on. But to keep that bicep brachii right in there, what we're going to find is it's got a fiber cartilage on the proximal end of that. Super cool. Super cool. And that is going to be a beefed up cable as it passes over there. Now, as we were talking earlier, all, like we have a ton of muscle that comes down and inserts right into our, our, our pelvis, right? So every time the puppy pulls on his patella, it's going to be right in that, in that groove under this one of our femur, right? So if we didn't beef that up, it's going to want to tear it into a short, right? So I can put my arm up in there, or I can come in and beef it up and put, put a bone there. Like how much stronger would a bone be? And a bone can change the direction of pull. So our patella, look at those patella ligaments, right? I don't like it being patella ligaments. But there, that's going to be a beefed up fiber cartilage. Okay? These are more like tendons. That's the beefed up fiber cartilage you see in the bicep brachia. That's kind of a way to think about its function. All right? And then look at this. You guys see this in this guy? See how there's two of them? Look at how complicated that joint is. Think about fluffy stepping and twisting. What joint is going to get twisted? What's going to try to tear? So when we think about a horse that has a cycle injury, is it just a medial patella ligament and a walking patella that we're really concerned, concerned with? No. Look at how complicated this joint is. There is so much going on there. Okay. And uh, thank you guys so much for uh, not sleeping. I know that anatomy would be really excited for studying it, but for an hour and 15 minutes, um, hour and 10 minutes, you guys, uh, not too many honors out there. Good job. Kudos to you guys. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you guys have a great day.